Um, uh, this last panel, uh, we, we sprinkled in a little bit of alliteration in the title. It's called Megabytes by the Morsel and Data by the Dollop. How will new mobile data plans affect consumers, innovation, and the mobile marketplace? Um, the, uh, the premise, uh, we were piqued, we were interested by the fact that when the iPad, it's not technically called the iPad 3, but the iPad 3, for lack of a better term, um, came out, uh, there were a lot of discussions about how the, the 4G LTE-enabled device um, could theoretically burn through a user's data cap um, within, within hours, which was really interesting to us. Um, and, and the idea that uh, mobile data plans uh, seem to be inevitably moving towards kind of more dynamic pricing um, really is, is really interesting to just generally everybody in the country. There are what I call the, the happy grandfathers. Um, I, I talk to people all the time said, oh, I'm grandfathered in under the unlimited data plan for Verizon or AT&T. And people, I've never seen people so excited about being a grandfather. Um, and uh, so, so that, that's, that's certainly interesting. Um, this panel is not looking at like the, the negative side uh, exclusively of, of these data plans. We really think it's kind of dynamic pricing. Um, several years ago when the Amazon um, uh, Kindle came out, um, one of the one of the uh, uh, devices actually came with prepaid um, data. You could download as many books as you wanted, and it seemed to be a relief for people. They didn't have to sign up for a plan. They didn't have to sign up for uh, commit to two years of, of an extra price. Um, really interesting. Maybe one of the reasons why um, the Kindle was initially very very successful. Um, overseas, we're seeing um, um, other dynamic pricing models uh, uh, where you would actually pay for devices that only did two things, like access Facebook and Twitter, and that's all the device does. Does, and you pay for the, the basically you're paying for the app and for the device and the data is included. Um, AT and T, I it was on, I'm on the impression AT and T is is experimenting with with similar plans um, where you know the the app would be preloaded um, uh, with data. Um, it would not count against your 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 data plan. Uh, those are all really really interesting to us. So uh, we put together a really really excellent uh, all star panel here, and uh, I we have so we have still a little time. I want to just. Go th go through um, the introductions very quickly, um, and, and their bios are all on the website. So um, I think we're going to do it in this order. Um, uh, Mary Brown uh, at the very end is with Cisco Systems. Been with Cisco since um, I think 2004. Um, uh, Mary does a lot of their uh, telecommunications work, and, high, and, and you know all know Cisco. Um, Roger Entner uh, right here is uh, he used to be with Nielsen. Now he's with uh, Recon Analytics. Uh, Roger just released um, a report I think yesterday, the day before, on, on mobile mobile data. Um, then we're going to go to Blair Levin, who's the Communications and Society Fellow at the Aspen Institute Communications and Society Program. Uh, Blair was one of the principal authors of the the National Broadband Plan for the Federal Communications Commission. Um, and then uh, Larry Magid, uh, syndicated columnist and journalist um, for CBS News. Uh, Larry writes for uh, New York Times, LA Times, um, everybody in between. Um, he has a, he's a regular contributor to C CNET and others. Um, also does a lot of family technology work. Uh, and then uh, Scott Walston, who is the uh, Vice President for Research and Senior Fellow at the Technology Policy Institute. Uh, uh, Scott uh, is with TPI, but more recently was with uh, the Federal Communications Commission. Um, uh, and, and I think that, and then we have Michael Weinberg, uh, who's the senior staff staff attorney for public knowledge. Uh, Michael's been working a lot on the, these data plan issues and, and, and some of those for public knowledge. So um, let me get right to it. And uh, we have we have a lot of folks. We have a lot of experts. I want to just get, dispense with the opening statements very very quickly, in, in maybe like three minutes, um, and then we can get into kind of a moderated discussion about uh, you know what we want to what, what we want to talk about. Um, there are a lot of different issues here. So let's get right to it. Um, let me start off with Mary, then go to Roger, and then in that order that I, I described. You have to press button. button. Now it says speak. Right. Okay, it's a little confusing because it's red to speak, not green. <laughs> um, I'm Mary Brown from Cisco. Thanks for having me. Um, Cisco is a networking company. One of the things we have to do is figure out what's going on inside our customer networks, inside our service provider customer networks from a traffic perspective so we know how to build the equipment that's going to serve them. We have to be looking way ahead of where they are today. So starting in 2009, we released uh, something we call the Visual Networking Index for Global Mobile. Um, this is a look at what's going on inside of mobile service provider networks. And I'm happy to say that's probably one of the most widely cited data sets in the industry today. We've been doing it every February since 2009. So uh, one of my theses during these remarks is really going to be that what we're seeing with traffic data and the huge increase in what's going on on the consumer side is directly relevant to the topic this morning on these data plans. 
um, we're really seeing a pivot point here between existing networks, technology, and spectrum um, moving to new all IP-based mobile networks and spectrum. And we're in this very uncomfortable pivot point where consumer demand is rising very quickly and our spectrum supply is not yet caught up. Um, so what is actually happening? Well, first, Cisco has found that U.S. mobile data traffic is taking off. It's growing 16-fold between 2011 and 2016. That's a huge increase. Why is that happening? Well, Tim touched on one of the reasons why, which is we've got these fabulous, powerful, wonderful toys in our hands, and we want to use them, right? We want to watch uh, video. We want to communicate on Facebook. We want to do things on the internet. And so these powerful devices are, are causing demand. But the story is actually even more nuanced than that. Um, uh, in addition uh, to just more powerful devices, uh, average users are using this, are going to be using this stuff more. And just to give you an example, in 2011, we found the average user was using 324 megabits a month of data on mobile networks from mobile devices. By 2016, that's going to grow to 4.2 gigabits. 74% of the users in the US are going to be using more than a gigabit of data. That's a huge increase in a very short time. Um, and there's going to be many more mobile connections. We're projecting by 2016 726 million connections. There's only going to be 348 million people, right? So that means a lot of machine to machine is going to be added into the mix for the first time now that we're in IP. And of course, we're going to have faster networks because many of the carriers are, in fact, rolling out LTE networks. So we see this, we see the data plans as simply a symptom of this pivot in the industry and, and the need to find a way to get more spectrum into the mix to help address it. One of the questions I always get is, well, gee, can't you smart technology people in Silicon Valley fix this spectrum crunch? And the answer is, well, it's going to take a combination of things. It's going to take a combination of better technologies, more efficient use of spectrum, but we cannot get away from the fact that we need more spectrum. And I think uh, I even saw a quote from the FCC to that respect in the, in the New York Times sometime in the last two weeks. So I'm going to stop there and we'll move on. That, that's great, Mary. I know there's a lot of data. It's hard to get it into three minutes. So <laughs> raising the spectrum issue. Roger? Thank you. Uh, my name is Roger Engner. I look at how the people are. Ah, there we go. Uh, my name is Roger Entner. I look at how uh, com how consumers are using uh, wireless services, why they're using it, what are their attitudes, and how can we provide this affordably to consumers for more widespread uh, widespread adoption, while everybody else in the value chain can make a living off it. And what we see is, you know, as um, Mary mentioned, usage is exploding. The other thing that uh, we don't hear as much is the cost per um, per byte, per text message, per, per minute is actually going down. Uh, when we hear, when we read the newspaper, we, you know, I read this morning like $10,000 phone bill, you know, um, just not uh, aberrations and, and, and wild stories when we see exactly that the average phone bill has decreased over the last year from about seven, $47.24 to $47 and, and even. You know, the cost per megabyte has gone down from $0.08 cents to $0.04. Cents. The price per text message, we hear all these horror stories of, oh, how expensive text messages are. The, the effective price per text message has dropped from $0.01 cent to $0.08. Cents. We're just using so many. That uh, uh, that it adds up, and I, I should note that this is our fourth annual State of the Mobile Net, and Roger spoke at our first annual State of the Mobile Net, which was a matter of months after the iPhone was introduced, and Roger had the data about consumption um, uh, for the iPhone, and everybody was in shock um, at that data. So um, thanks, thanks for being here, Roger. Um, I think next, Blair. I'd like to make a strategic point and illustrate it with a tactical point. The strategic point uh, is a macroeconomic point. For approximately 5,000 years, every major increase in economic growth 
uh, has been uh, a function of the replacement of some inputs with new inputs. So we replaced human power with animal power 5,000 years ago, began the agricultural revolution. Um, uh, about 300 years ago, we started an industrial revolution with new sources of power, new sources of transportation, replaced those in the 1900s with new sources of power, new sources of transportation. Last 20 years, the biggest economic story other than the movement of power from uh, west to east, which is not the subject of this panel. Uh, the biggest story is the replacement of analog atoms inputs with bits, chips, and bandwidth. So in the economic era to come, one of the most important things for a country to succeed is to have sufficient bandwidth and a psychology of abundance of bandwidth to drive economic growth. So the context for this, this discussion, and in fact, I would argue uh, in the next four years, the next FCC will have to address this because of, if you look at a lot of international trends, we're not doing well. Um, the, the context ought to be, how does the country have a strategic bandwidth advantage? That's not either for or against regulation. In fact, I think it's very complicated. But the point is, what we need to have is a psychology of abundance of bandwidth for innovation. Um, and, and let me illustrate it with a tactical point. Recently, there was a wonderful meeting with the chairman of the FCC and the head of the Department of the uh, Secretary of Education talking about digital textbooks, something we wrote about in the broadband plan, something that's very exciting, something America ought to lead in, something that can really improve education. But here's the problem. They didn't talk about uh, two barriers to uh, having digital education. Um, one is, of course, state textbook adoption boards, all of which ought to be eliminated. Again, not the subject of this panel. Uh, but it would have been nice if they had discussed that. The other thing is uh, bandwidth caps. They're not going to, uh, if you have bandwidth caps, I can tell you right now, it is very unlikely that digital textbooks will work in this country, or alternatively, we will create a new kind of digital divide. For digital textbooks to be all that they can be, you're going to do a lot of two way communication, a lot of video, you're going to blow through these caps easily. And so in the broadband plan, uh, something that was not terribly noticed, but we thought was important, we noted that we expressed no opinion on usage-based caps uh, pricing, but thought that there was certainly a possibility it might come, but that national purposes ought to be exempted, for, that there ought to be an inquiry, I should say, as to whether technically you can exempt those uses um, and also what the economics of it are. In other words, you don't want the Good Samaritan who is sending a video of an accident to the cops and to, uh, to, and, and to the PSAP to be charged for doing that. You know, you don't want the next generation of 911 where if you, are, uh, you need an ambulance, you want to send your whole medical record. Um, you don't want to be charged for that. There are a lot of healthcare uses, education uses, public safety uses, and frankly, democracy uses that you don't want subject to those caps. There are a lot of issues in that, which is why we talked about an inquiry. But the, the point is we have to, th that's, that's an example of how we need to have uh, a psychology of abundance, particularly in certain areas. All right, great, we're moving on. Uh, um, Larry? Yeah, I'm Larry Maggot, and uh, in addition. In addition to being with CBS News as uh, Tim pointed out, I'm also with ConnectSafely.org, which is an internet safety organization. And I speak a lot to consumers. And the consumers I talk to, uh, first of all, they're being encouraged to cut the cord. And as people know, a very large number and growing number of households don't have landlines. And a lot of households that young people live in don't have cable or satellite television either. So for example, I have two children. Neither one of them has any wires, as far as I know, coming into their homes other than the electrical wires. And, and I'm not even sure they're going to need that soon. Uh, so they're relying more and more on broadband, on, on wireless broadband, I should say, for just about all of their digital connections, certainly for their conversations, uh, certainly for their messaging, but also for their, their entertainment and educational resources. Just yesterday, MIT and Harvard announced that they're going to be offering free online courses uh, which is a tremendous opportunity for millions of people to get a world-class education without having to pay or attend or uh, be admitted to institutions like Harvard and MIT. You can't turn on the television without seeing some kind of a referral to go to our website. You're watching a, a network broadcast show and they say go to abc.com or cbs.com to watch back episodes. And so we have industry really pushing us towards broadband, and then we have Apple and all the Android players selling us better, faster devices with larger screens 
and with faster connections. The LTE uh, iPhone, uh, iPad third generation is simply the tip of the iceberg. So consumers are being pushed in the direction of more and more consumption. Uh, much of the t- traditional wired consumption is being offloaded to, uh, to wireless, yet at the same time, we're being told that we have to limit our consumption. My daughter is among many people who are very confused. Even her unlimited plan, because she, even though she's in her early 20s, she too is a grandfather, she got an email from AT&T telling her that you're using too much of your unlimited data, which struck her as a little bit of an oxymoron. How you can use, it's sort of like there was an episode of The Simpsons when uh, Homer was kicked out of an all-you-can-eat restaurant because he ate too much. Uh, but the bottom line is that we are, being cons- we are being encouraged to be data gluttons, yet we're being punished for it. And I just yesterday, in preparation of the panel, went to both AT&T and Verizon's um, websites and tried to figure out what is the meaning of these terms they're using, such as you can buy one gigabyte or 300 megabytes, and then they have these charts that try to translate them into how many voicemails or emails or text messages or minutes of streaming video. And even with, I think, their best and sincere efforts to explain it, it was still daunting and confusing. And I really think that we have a generation of people who uh, essentially have this device in their hand which is like a credit card that they don't have any control over, that just charges are just coming, and they have no concept of what it is they're spending and how much they're paying for it and what kind of bill they're going to get at the end of the month. Right now, because of the fact that most of us, I guess, are using sub-gigabytes amount of data, it's sub-crisis, it's pre-crisis. But as more and more people start using mobile broadband for all of their entertainment needs, and, and indeed there are some households I know of, I think, Kim, you're one of them, right, where your only connection to broadband is your, is your wireless device, then that's going to affect our ability to consume. At the same time, corporations are trying to encourage us to consume more. So somehow, somewhere, we have to figure out this discrepancy. Scott? Sure, thanks. Um, I'm just going to make three quick points that I think are uh, important for thinking about this issue. The first is that uh, in industries with high fixed costs, the prices are never going to be just about marginal cost. You can't set the price equal to marginal cost or you'll go out of business. Um, so if you focus on just whether the caps are relevant to congestion or whether you're paying for the how much it costs to send your text message, that's never going to get you to the answer. Prices are always, one way or another, going to be above marginal cost. Um, and so that's, that's the first point. The second is that competition is crucial. Um, and, and as long as we have multiple networks offering different types of plans, right now we have some that are unlimited, some that aren't. Uh, in, in voice, we have pay as you go, we have unlimited, we have buckets of minutes and so on. Uh, then you know, there's, it, it's hard to think of re- good reasons to, to worry. Uh, and it becomes just another way that carriers might differentiate themselves. You might prefer to have a better network with, uh, with a lower cap, or you might prefer to have unlimited with a not quite as good a network, and, and so on. Um, but that is rela- the co- competition um, is related to the third point, which is that this market, both in terms of demand, with more and more smartphones and iPads and so on, and supply transitioning from 3G to 4G technologies, is changing really quickly, and we have no idea what an equilibrium price, uh, that set of prices is going to look like yet. Um, and we should be really careful about setting rules that might affect entry. You wouldn't want to, say, tell Metro PCS that it's not allowed to offer a particular type of plan because it's not as good as Verizon's plan. Metro PCS will probably never be able to compete with Verizon, right? So, you know, would you want to tell them that they can't, uh, that, 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 that they can't, uh, you know, have a very specialized or tailored plan? Some people would obviously say yes because they tried to tell them that. Um, but if you try to make everyone offer only unlimited service, then only the incumbents, will, the biggest incumbents, will ever be able to compete. So in, we need to be very careful about uh, what policy does at this, uh, you know, as we are moving towards what will be a, an equilibrium. Uh, Michael. So I agree with a lot of what's been set up here already, but I do want to point out one thing. Um, a week or two ago, we put out a white paper called Know Your Limits, and it was designed to be a fairly deep dive into thinking about all sorts of usage-based pricing. And it was interpreted by some, in some quarters, I think probably before they read it, as an attack from public knowledge on the idea of usage-based pricing. And uh, as, as time has gone on and more people have read it, we've gotten feedback that people recognize that it was not an attack on usage-based pricing. Usage-based pricing is a tool And like any tool, it can be used for good or for bad. One of the problems is that usage-based pricing 
imposes costs on society in a way that can be problematic, that can be anti-competitive, that can get rid of this psychology of abundance, that can reduce new entrants, all sorts of things. And so one of the really critical things when you think about usage-based pricing and especially data caps is to begin to understand them and make sure that they aren't living in a black box. We've been, we've been trying to say, look, we don't, we don't know enough about data caps as an organization, as a, as a public, to know whether they are good or bad, whether they are reasonable or unreasonable. We've been trying to get some simple information about it, and it's been very hard, and that's been very troubling. All, we, all we've been trying to figure out is, how are the caps set? You know, what, what goals are they trying to achieve, and, and how did you arrive at, at two gigabytes or, or four or six or whatever it is? Once they're set, how are they evaluated against those goals? And going forward, what would cause them to change? And so far, we've been unable to get even those basic answers from some of the carriers and some of the ISPs. And so it really, it stops the discussion in its tracks because if you don't even understand what the theory is behind these things that are being implemented, you have no ability to take that next step and ask a question, is this reasonable? Is this the rational way to achieve these goals? Considering all the costs and all the benefits, is this the way to go? And so what this would really benefit from is just more information about what is actually driving these these caps, this, this type of billing, and then really thinking through whether or not that, that's the best way to do those things. Well, thank you. And, and um, before I go, I want to get to Mary's point about spectrum and, and, and some of those issues that was kind of uh, uh, highlighted by Scott as well. But before we do that, I wanted to spend a little more time in my intro. I mentioned that um, the premise of this panel isn't necessarily that the, these things are particularly bad um, or, or that they're, you know, the Kindle as introduced, um, uh, I think was really interesting in the sense that people were able to buy, you know, data um, as they bought their device and unlimited unlimited books. Um, go, there's other dynamic plans out there. Um, Giga OM uh, wrote an article yesterday s suggesting that um, Apple um, could actually have leverage to buy wholesale, um, you know, wireless um, by different different carriers across here and sell a device that had you know data bundled into it, um, suggesting that you know as Apple did with um, with the first iPhone and AT and T, they just have a lot lot more leverage than we give them credit for, um, and that we may be moving to a, a more wholesale uh, data plan pricing. And and so I guess the question is, you know, Roger, you do a lot of research. Larry, you're you're you're, you're a technology writer. Um, at, let's look at the the, the positive sides of, of dynamic pricing, right? Yeah, when we look at at dynamic pricing, it when we look at unlimited plans and fixed price plans, they are the one size fits it all. And when we look at fashion, we know instinctively that that is a really bad idea, because for most of the people it doesn't fit. So usage pr pricing actually makes it possible that light users are paying a lot less than uh, they would under a uh, one size fits all plan and that the small mi uh, minority of people that are really heavy users are uh, paying their, their appropriate share. When we look at, um, when we look actually at uh, actual usage and compare it to the, uh, to the price plans and to the buckets that uh, the carriers have set, we clearly see that uh, only 95% plus uh, only the top 95 percentile of users are going to be over the bucket. So it's a very small but very vocal minority that are really into their device, really passionate about it, and when it doesn't work the way they want it to work, they let you know. And they take over the, the web and, and talk about it. What people don't talk about it is, you know, uh, when the, that the average consumer is using, you know, 300 to 500 uh, megabytes a month, and there is a lot of people who use uh, even less. Those are the people who are actually getting taken advantage of by uh, by unlimited plans because they are the ones who are subsidizing everybody else. So usage-based pricing really allows uh, the, the appropriate price point to be levied to. Uh, to the to actual usage, you know. Thank you. 
And Larry, you, I mean, you are, you live out in Silicon Valley, yeah. there. like, and you're you're a big user of Facebook. What if what if next month is if the rumors are true, or you know, a couple months from now, Facebook introduces the Facebook phone and says, you know, it's twenty dollars a month, do whatever you want on Facebook, and but that's pretty much all you all you use. Well, in fact, in Kenya, there already is. If if you're a Kenyan, where you pay dearly relative to your income for for uh, data, you can access Facebook for free. Um, Kenya, I'm not sure, has a network neutrality uh, regime. I, Blair probably knows more about this than I do, but the issue is, it, is you could offer, and as you mentioned, AT&T apparently is looking at doing deals where they would do what they call the 800 number of broadband, where instead of the user paying for the call or for the connection to Facebook or Twitter or Netflix or whatever it is, the, uh, the provider, the Netflix or the, the Facebook people would pay for it, which on the surface of it, does seem very consumer friendly, but then you start getting very scared about the whole network neutrality issue, where suddenly I'm I'm getting Netflix for free because the carrier and Netflix have a deal together, but I have to pay for Hulu, or or whatever the deal. Larry, happens I'm to be. old. I'm old enough to remember that I used to love 1-800 numbers. Well, 1-800 numbers had their advantage, but we didn't have that network. Well, I guess we did have some level of neutrality on phone calls, but but anyway, the bottom line is there's going to be all sorts of creative ways. Uh, to make data available. But but the bottom line is that this notion, I agree that perhaps on average, uh, Americans only use, uh, you know, half a gigabyte a month or perhaps less. But I also know that there are people, and they're not the data hogs, they're not the people who are up there, you know, on BitTorrent uploading constantly, just normal users like my daughter, who's not that techie, who just likes to watch Hulu when she goes to the gym, that she's going, you know, she is using, apparently she's one of that 5%, and she's not somebody who's, who's hogging information. She just wants to watch video on her phone. Well, and, and video is the number one uh, data consumption tool. If, if we would not have video, we would, have, we would not have that spectrum crunch that we're having. It's just the most dominant and, and bandwidth intensive application out there. 60, more than 60% of all the traffic on wireless networks is video. So she, she's using her cell phone like she's using her television set. But the point is she can't even purchase an all-you-can. She happens to be the grandfather didn't do a theoretical all-you-can. But that's not even available except on Sprint from the major networks. That's okay. why I have a Sprint phone. Okay, I do so, enjoy that. So, so it, it, within an efficient pricing scheme would co have, have the fixed cost be covered over as large a number of people as possible. And what that means – uh, in any industry, is that the heaviest users, the people with the highest demand, will pay the most, regardless of whether they're causing congestion on the network or not. Your daughter is a, is a very heavy user. She should pay more. Don't ask everyone else to subsidize her use. But the point is that And you also said that there's Sprint, there's a company right now that offers one, unlimited plans. There is one company. So as, as long as that's the case, it's not even clear that there's a problem here, right? Uh, Michael? I, I mean, this is a really good illustration of what we talk about. You know, only five percent of users have a problem with this, and so when you when, I, when you say that as a general statement, you think, oh, well, these are these super techie people doing really weird internet stuff that doesn't even make sense to the rest of us. But the reality is, the top five percent of users are people who represent what everyone's going to be doing in two right. or three or four years. You look at these numbers, these are the numbers we were speaking out before, is this is what people are doing, and it's not doing crazy internet stuff that no one understands. It's, hey, I'm at the gym, and I don't want to watch whatever is on, on the TV in the gym. I've got this great device, and that I want to use it. So the idea that we're going we're gonna to create a pricing scheme now that works for, that nominally works for 95% of the users today, and then just you know, assume that that is going to work from here on forward. Either it does work or it doesn't work. If it does work, it's because we've frozen innovation in today's terms and have stopped people from doing new and interesting things. If it doesn't work, it's because people want to do those things so badly they're running up against the caps. Neither of those are particularly good outcomes if you don't structure the system intelligently. Now, now Mike, uh, you're, you're assuming that people's use is going to continue to grow, which I believe is a true assumption, um, but that these plans won't change. Uh, and so why should, why should plans be structured today to benefit what the majority of people will do five years from now? This is, this is again, the, the questions that we've been raising. We haven't seen these caps move very quickly or respond to very much information, to, to, to what market conditions are doing. People well, are using more video now than they were before, but yeah. they haven't changed. Well, you have seen AT&T adjust their, uh, their price, uh, their, their buckets from two to three. Uh, basically, they increased them by, by 50% about uh, 
two years after the introduction, you de facto have seen uh, Verizon do the uh, same thing because th they have the two megabyte plan and you know for the last five months they're giving you double the data. So that promotion is actually their standard offer. So by default, all these uh, price plans have been increasing by 50 to 100 percent because you know the wireless carriers are not don't have a malicious joy of pissing people off by sending them <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know nasty grams <laughs> on, by, by text mail uh, uh, you know it, it it's just bad bad uh, policy and and you know you try to have a good relationship with your customers and not one where you drive them perpetually nuts Mary so I would be remiss if everybody walked out of the room thinking we had a top 5% problem. That's not what the Cisco yeah. data shows. It used to be we had a top 1% problem and then maybe a top 5% problem. But today, that's not what's really happening. What's really happening is we have about a 20% issue. 20% 20 of the subscribers in any given month are going to be in the top in terms of consumption and that they cycle in and out month to month, mm. right? So some months... Uh, they may, you know, an individual may be a very heavy user the next month down, and the carriers are trying to deal with a highly dynamic and changing environment. I, I agree with the comments that I don't think today's data caps uh, are the end of data pricing uh, for mobile data. I think they're the very beginning, and what we're seeing here at the very start of this very dynamic change in the market is their attempt to come to grips with it which is obviously going to have to be modified over time. I mean, Blair raised some very important issues about public safety. These issues are going to have to uh, be dealt with over time. But we're at the very beginning here. And, and we're, we have to respect the fact we're dealing with a highly dynamic market. Uh, so can I, can I just I, say that I, I think that it's not a 5% problem or a 10% problem. I, I just think the analysis of looking at it that way is, is wrong, in part because I'm very sympathetic to Scott's third point having been through the cable pricing um, of the Cable Act of 92 when I was at the FCC the first time, I'm, I'm really nervous about any government attempt to get into how you package things, how you price things, and all that. I, what I think we're confusing is what's the role of business and what's the role of policy? Business should try to figure it out how to get a return on their investment. That's, that's what they should do. It's very legitimate. And Scott's exactly right. You can't expect a high CapEx... Uh, industry to price on a marginal cost basis, okay? But what's the role of government? Well, there's a couple different ones, and I think we're missing the point. One is to make sure that there are sufficient inputs to have a psychology of abundance, which is why I, I was the first government official at the time to ever utter the words looming spectrum crunch. And that was for a very important reason, that I think it was important to understand that the biggest risk to the broadband ecosystem from a 10-year perspective uh, looking at, at that time, it was 2009, uh, was lack of spectrum. That still exists, though I would say that what we've learned, and I would hope um, one New York Times columnist wrote the other day about how governments never seem to learn, but what we've learned over the last couple of years is the path of reclamation of spectrum is very difficult, so we may have to find, address the looming spectrum crunch in a different way through more sharing technologies. But the point is, that has to be at the core of the debate, not how do we um, articulate how the companies should uh, do their business, but rather how do we make sure we're appropriately using inputs. But the second thing is we have to understand what the public goods are. The first one is economic growth, and how do we have a policy that drives economic growth through innovation, through the replacement of traditional goods and services with bandwidth services, which we want to have happen and we want to lead the world in. And the second, how do we deliver essential public goods and services? And that's where the right, that's where the debate ought to be. I just want to one thought, and I want to pick up on, on Michael's point about the future. I think the future is going to get here a lot faster than we think. When you look at the amount in which data is being pushed to us by the apps that we're downloading, by the entertainment, by the educational process, by the movement towards telemedicine, I really think that it's going to get to a point where the, the majority of, of users are pushing up against those two, three gigabyte limits. And it, whether it's this year or next year or five years from now, I'm not sure. But somehow we have to figure out a way, and I don't know what the pricing model ought to be, but we have to figure out a way where people are able to get this data 
are able to get it in a way that's affordable, and most importantly, are able to get it in a way that's not going to get them sticker shock. So suddenly, they have this surprise bill at the end of the month that they had never anticipated. There has to be some way. If I get in my car and I decide to drive, at least I kind of know how many miles per gallon I, gallon I, I get and how much I pay for gasoline. I have some notion what this trip is going to cost me. And I have a feeling that people who are using broadband today, it's an absolute black box. Let me um, let me just kind of, I, what I, I hear uh, folks saying is that as we set this up, that there's going to be dynamic pricing going forward. Uh, this is just the beginning. I'm, I'm glad that um, Mary agrees with that premise. Um, it's just the beginning of this. Michael is, seems to be saying, well, um, you know, but look at it in the current context of the pricing plans that we have, five gigs or whatever. And let's look at that problem for a moment. Um, uh, I think uh, Roger is saying that, and I was saying earlier, that maybe the carrier don't have as much leverage as we think they do. Um, you were saying don't maliciously piss off your customer. And I was saying, you know, Apple seems to have a fair amount of clout in the marketplace as well. Um, but looking at the current pricing, if we can just look at the here and now, um, and again, knowing that the future is going to get much more dynamic, are these are the current pricing models uh, sufficient to address the problem, whether it be spectrum crunch or, or, or the like, and congestion, are, are the way they're doing it right now tailored to kind of alleviate congestion in Spectrum? Well, if, if we take one step back, carriers actually like unlimited pricing plans because it's really easy to, to sell because you can just say, here, use it, don't worry about it, you know, and it's really easy to bill because it's one price. You don't have to count anything. Uh, usage prices are actually an implicit admission by the carriers that they can't predict the usage pattern. Because, for example, if you're using w what is to the consumer an unlimited voice plan, is actually to a wireless carrier about a 1500 minute plan, because that's what unlimited usage customers are using. So that's how they put their pricing around it. They say, this is how much they will use, it will not go up or down. And it hasn't gone up or down over the last several years. So it's very predictable pricing and very predictable usage. On wireless devices, they have a better idea than the average consumer what will come down the road in a year or two, but not enough that they're by now able to put actually a pricing decision around it. And so because they have been really badly surprised by the smartphones themselves. And we have seen some of the uh, uh, usage and, and, uh, and drop calls and, and low data speeds are actually a result of, of their in inability to forecast what is actual demand. So, uh, and the reaction to it was usage-based pricing. And the usage-based pricing is a temporary situation until we figure out what is, what is ultimately no, no question. Usage. We're looking to the future, and but right now, is is usage based pricing or, or or five gig caps? Is that an appropriate way to deal with the problem that we think we have, which is congestion? It's the best tool that that is available, and it's doing a reasonably good job. So the well, I, the idea is that you know you have a five gig limit, which I do on on my on my MiFi, um, in that I I kind of have that in the back of my head. I'm not really sure how many megabytes I'm using. But it kind of tempers how I how I use it, and I, I kind of in the back of my mind, and I'm trying to make sure I limit my bandwidth use, and, and that's that's where we are right now. It is the best tool we have, so it it has helped uh, to a large extent, and the adjustments show that they're monitoring how usage and uh, and and congestions and capital investment stays in hand, and and uh, how they have to provision all these services. So. Once they figure, once we have reached this terminal level, you will see unlimited pricing come back, undoubtedly. So good enough for now. Good enough for now. But let's let's take a minute and and examine what you just said, right? So and compare usage-based pricing to a traditional way of price discrimination on on networks, which is by speed. Um, right now, you said, okay, I have this cap. I don't really know what five gigabyte cap means. I don't know what it means in any given day for any activity, so I kind of don't do some things that I wish I could do and hope that I stay under the cap. Right? This is a really inefficient way 
to have you regulate your use. There's almost no feedback loop for you while you're doing well, it. Well, you know, and the way I said it, I, I wasn't, I was being cheeky, I guess. No, I think uh, you were being I, accurate. I, I do well, kind of know. You, I have, mean, you have, every carrier has by now applications on on the smartphones yeah, I, that I, if I, you I, just press but, a, a, the touch of a tells button, me, tells you how much, how much sure, you have used. Sure, but compare that to, compare that like, to speed. But speed, speed is something that if I want to do, if I want to do something and I'm worried about my connection, my connection is too slow to handle it. That's an immediate feedback that everyone understands. I don't have to open another app. I don't have to look at a gauge. I don't have to look at a gauge and calculate what that means for the rest of the month and what else I have to do. It's just a, it's a signal to consumers that people understand immediately. With with the monthly data caps, it's just it strikes me as an incredibly inefficient way to signal the customers they either need to pay more or do less. Well, well, so, well it's so like the me, fuel uh, gauge in, in your car, and you refuse to look at the fuel gauge. <laughs> So and I, then complain that the car stops running. Right. I, I'm, I'm sure AT and T would be willing to hook up some, uh, some, uh, you know, give you an electric shock uh, immediately, <laughs> especially you. Um, but, uh, th but I think the focus on congestion though is a little bit missing a point, and I think the carriers are partly to blame for that because they talk about it a lot. But again, it's you know, in, in a, in a, like I, I keep I keep saying. Um, you, which should, in a, an efficient pricing scheme, would charge heavy users more, regardless of whether they're imposing additional costs on the network, which means regardless of whether they are causing congestion at that time. Um, and so the, the focus, uh, having, the, having caps at around you know, three gigabytes, two gigabytes, does cause people, I think, to pay more attention to it. So I think it puts more of a binding constraint on people and is likely to do something about congestion. But I don't think that's the real, that's the real purpose of it. Um, but and at the, although I've been giving you a hard time, I, think it is, I do agree that people don't yet have a good sense of what, um, what bandwidth really means. Uh, and you know, we're going to have to learn that. Yeah. But they do have to know for it to work. I agree with that. So we can come back to this, but I think the next the next point or the next basket of issues was raised by Blair and, and also Larry. Uh, Larry talking about his daughter accessing video. Larry talking about uh, public safety uh, uh, and, and education, as was was Larry. And there's this question about as we go forward. You know, do we have any carve outs for what you know what are these public social policy issues that we really want to promote that we don't want to chill uh, because of some kind of data plan or some kind of thing like if, if you have a face like if you have a if you have a mobile phone, and I think some criminals found this out, if you have a mobile phone that has no plan whatsoever, like it's, it doesn't has no plan whatsoever, but if you dial 911, um, it connects to dial 911. Um, <laughs> somebody did a, like a butt dial. Um, they were committing a crime, and they they had their their phone bricked, and it actually called 911. They didn't realize it, and the the 911 operators <laughs> heard them committing the crime, and they located them GPS. And so, are there some exceptions to um, uh, to this policy that you know, as we start thinking about it as we are going forward into the future, that you would carve out? I I obviously would. Well, and let me restate that. We started in the plan looking at this, and we realized, given the limitation we had in terms of time uh, and the number of issues we were dealing with, we really didn't. We, we had some documents filed with us, which indicated there are a number of different technological approaches, but we really couldn't get into making a recommendation at that time. I think it would be wise for the commission to start a proceeding just to look at it, but not with the sense that it necessarily knows the conclusion, uh, because it could be that the plans adjust in a way that it, it, re it really doesn't matter. But I think we should at least explore it. And I would note that uh, for all of the folks here who are representing members of Congress, you have a uh, 18th century version of this since the post office has long exempted um, mail coming through from members of Congress for a public policy reason. And uh, it's it's w whether it be 911, what we do with phones today or, or that, that's that's kind of the analogy. So, so we should have the Facebook Frank. Is that what you're saying? Something like that. No, actually, probably not Facebook. But, uh, <laughs> but I do, I do think that in the cases of uh, uh, healthcare, education, uh, public safety, and democracy, uh, we ought to at least explore the possibility. Um, but again, it depends on what the record shows in terms of both the technological path and the economics. Mary. Yeah, I would say um, with respect to the public safety issues, sadly, this is not a pressing policy matter. Uh, given where we are with the nation's 911 system, um, we are stuck firmly in the mid 20th century on voice technology, and you cannot send a video, much less a text message, to most 911 centers today, and that's not going to change anytime soon. Uh, as sad as that fact is, it will change, I believe, in the long run. So we have a lot of time to debate this. Um, on the education front, I think you know it's still early days. I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about in the panel yet is how 
uh, consumers and carriers, for that matter, are using Wi-Fi offloading uh, to try to get yeah. around these data cap issues. I mean, in schools and in homes, the way you would download a book, or at least the way I download my books when I want to read them on my tablet, is on a Wi-Fi connection to a wired broadband network. Um, and then I don't pay anything on my data cap. Um, that might not help Tim, uh, who apparently doesn't have a wired broadband connection, but he is in a very small minority of households today that that's uh, that's getting mobile only broadband. The majority of people do have either a, uh, a, a DSL fiber cable modem or satellite modem broadband connection, so they can utilize that Wi-Fi offloading capacity. And, and I've, as I've said, you know the fact that I only have a wireless connection, um, I'm not tempted to download salacious videos, which really helps my immortal soul. <laughs> so that is a net benefit. <laughs> Um, oh. if let I, me, if let I me... make one observation, yes. uh, virtually all wireline uh, broadband internet providers have a data cap on it. Uh, it's just very high, but there is a cap on it. Uh, Liza, question. Pricing is, is reasonable uh, mechanism for carriers to, to, to use. Um, should there be a role still, though, for government to make sure that it's not used in an anti-competitive way outside of just pricing their services? There was an article in GigaOM uh, the other day about Sony holding back on an online uh, TV programming offering because of uncertainty about Comcast data caps, and I present this question to everybody on the panel. I mean, absolutely. We've one of the we. This is obviously a wireless panel, but on the on the wired side, there is there is a clear conflict between a company that both sells high speed internet service and television service because that high speed internet connection can be used to replace its television service. And that's that's again that's why we're at the stage, at least at public knowledge, we're at the stage where we really want the data cap process to be a transparent process. Because we're, we are not saying there's no way to do this reasonably, but there are an awful lot of tempting ways to do it unreasonably. And so you know, Comcast has a 250 gigabyte cap. That seems like a lot until you look at some of their filings and they've, they have calculated that the amount of data you would need to replace their TV offering is 288 gigabytes. And that's a, and that's a, that's a cap that it was set in 2008 and it has not changed. And so you ask questions, again, not saying that there was a conscious decision at Comcast and, you know, in their evil lair on a mountain or anything like that to, to crush that competition, but the temptation is there when you don't necessarily have the competitive pressure to move the caps as quickly as, as the public might like. There's just there's this fantastic temptation, and that's why you really need to bring some sunlight to the, to the process to understand what the purpose of the caps are. Is it, a, is it a congestion issue? Is it a price discrimination issue? Why they're there? And just why, how they're being run and operated? So um, th the answer is yes. Uh, I mean, that's what the Department of Justice is for, um, uh, at least you know, in, in any anti an antitrust sense. Um, some of these uh, might be classic antitrust issues. Uh, and you know, they should be looked at case by case. And the Justice Department should definitely be on the, on the job to look at them, either self-dealing issues uh, and so on. I mean, but in response to the transparency issue, it, it, they do have to be, absolutely, they have to be transparent to consumers, and you need to know what counts to the plan and what doesn't. But I don't understand the request to want to know from the companies how they decided to set these prices. What are they going to tell you? They're going to say, yeah, we need to cover our fixed costs, too. Um, you know, it doesn't, the, the request itself doesn't make sense. The question is how it affects consumers um, and then whether there are uh, anti-competitive, whether, whether there are anti-competitive price discrimination can issues. I, can, I, can I ask a follow-up? I'm, I'm changing it a bit. Can I ask a follow-up question about what we're asking these companies to provide? Um, I, I'm, I've become addicted to, somebody put a frozen yogurt um, shop in the basement of uh, the ground floor of my building, which is really bad because I'm in there every day. It's frozen, yo, you know, down on I Street. Um, and I, I go in there and I, I pour way too much frozen yogurt into my cup. Um, and I, I try to limit it, but I always like fill it up. And then I put it on a scale, and that's how, that's how I pay for it. That's the pricing structure. And on the scale, there's a little tag. And it says, um, it's, it's approved of weights and measures by the District of Columbia, I think. And it, it like, they, they check it every, I don't know how many months, and they have like a punch thing that they've checked it. Um, if we measure uh, frozen yogurt, uh, we measure deli meats, 
we measure a lot of stuff. Um, uh, wouldn't we measure, is there a role from, you know, disclosure and measuring of, of data by uh, the Federal Trade Commission or whoever does it, NIST, or the, I don't know, who does it? So I think the FCC has been trying to do some of that uh, with their Sam Knows project. Um, and uh, for the purposes of this audience, we can say that measuring uh, data on networks is very complicated. Uh, uh, there's many moving parts, and you can't always be sure if you're, what you're looking at and uh, to whom one does one attribute um, a slowdown in speeds. Um, but I think the FCC has already been uh, trying to look at that and trying to get the data out to consumers about what the real speeds are. And, and just for the record, if, um, if there was a, a frozen yogurt cap, a monthly cap, that would limit the amount that I ate, I'd really appreciate it. So, um, Baron, in the back, one question. And So it's certainly a fantastic floor, uh, and I don't want to. I don't want to suggest that there is no role for the DOJ, but history has suggested, and especially in recent years, that that current antitrust jurisprudence is not necessarily well matched to some of the competitive problems that you see in the communications space. And so, well, of course, there are there are you know probably one of the most famous antitrust cases is a communications case. So I'm not going to say that there's no role for it. Um, it doesn't seem to be able to deal with the nuance of some of the problems here. But again, and you say that based on what? I'm sorry, you say that based on what? What evidence is that that they're not capable of dealing with some of these nuances? Well, I would say that there's been a lot of problematic uh, actions in the communication space in the last 10 years with consolidation with some of the some of the pricing structures and prices the dropped and, and, and what is the evidence that the Department of Justice was not able to deal with it? Well, because they they continue to happen and the Department of Justice wasn't well, able to address well, it. Well, if but look at look at the data pricing has dropped consistently in staggering amounts, you know, everybody is complaining about uh, how expensive wireless data is on a per megabyte basis, it dropped by 50% year over year. Show me another uh, commodity or, or product that we're buying today that is half, expense, half as expensive on a per unit basis today as it was a year ago. Well, actually, Where's want, the problem? Well, actually, it was funny. When you mentioned earlier, you were talking about text message pricing and how the cost of text messaging has gone down. and. Well, it's true that the per unit cost has gone down. The price to consumers has gone up because what you saw as those as the the buckets became cheaper, the cheap buckets disappeared. And so you had you had people moving up to larger buckets so they were paying more for the same amount of use. And so the, I'm, I am not again, well, I'm I, th not I think the usage led the, the the buckets not the other way around. You can't really People didn't start using more text messages suddenly because they had a larger bucket. So they thought, oh, my God, I need to get my money's worth. And so I sent another five messages, no matter if I have to say something or not. But if I was a user who said, OK, I use 300 messages a month, and I want to pay the, for the 500 message bucket, and then I woke up one day and I only could get the 1,000 message bucket and was still going to use the 300 messages, all of a sudden the price for my text messaging plan, even the, the, the per message cost went down. But you're always up. grandfathers. Nobody, nobody showed up and said, oh, when, when the 500 or when the 300 message plan went away or the 500 message plan went away, nobody went around and said, oh, by the way, um, you have to get now the 1,000 uh, message plan. You're grandfathered into the, the old plan. So Which you just should, locks you, you so into your carrier for the rest so of your life. So you should also be in favor of the messaging plans that charge you 25 cents a message, right? Because that allows you to do it exactly a la carte. You know, being a Washington outsider, there's a <laughs> lot of things I don't understand about this town. For example, I'm not able to read a congressional bill. It's completely 
it's impossible for me. And I think the same thing is true for a lot of people about reading their phone bill. And so when I listen to this discussion, and I don't know what the solution is. I don't know what the policy should be. I mean, that's, that's for the smart people in this room to figure out. But I do know that the general public is totally oblivious and doesn't really have a clue as to what's going on here. And so you've got all of these companies selling them these wonderful devices like this iPad sitting here and saying, look at the wonderful things you can do. And by the way, we just put in an LTE cellular connection on there, so now you can download data 10 times as fast. But if you do it, you're actually going to go through your data plan within, within hours, if not minutes. And so there's a huge disconnect between the promises and the reality. And so when, the mere fact that Tim has to meter his data usage, and I have to, we all have to meter our data usage. Again, I don't because I happen to have the one carrier that, 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 that's struggling and may not stay in business that does allow for unlimited data. For a reason. Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. And by the way, it's slow, and, and, and there are advantages to AT&T and, and Verizon. But the bottom line is that from a, a broader perspective, if we're going to move forward into a digital society, to the point where where this becomes the ticket to Americans' financial revival, where this becomes the ticket to people's educational opportunities, where this becomes the ticket to Hollywood's um, fortunes in being able to provide entertainment uh, in ways that people can consume on the go wherever they are, then this is a problem that has to be solved. And my guess is that it lies in the Cisco's and the FCC's of the world to figure out a way around the broadband crunch. And you know, that's not easy. I know that's a huge challenge. But the bottom line is that consumers are confused. It's totally untransparent. And they're being sold something, and then they're being told after they buy it that, oh, by the way, you can't afford to use it. A um, little bit like a Hummer. <laughs> I, I, um, I, you know, we've talked a lot about consumers appropriately. I think because this is a ubiquitous concern among consumers. Is everybody's, you know, all the people have mobile phones and they're concerned about their data usage. Um, we talked a lot about the carriers. Um, I asked the panels also ponder um, what the impact of, of of data plans and dynamic data plans, you know, good, the good and the bad, um, would have on innovation. And you know, I, we could talk about you know network innovation, obviously, and we've talked a bit about that. Um, but what about you know, kind of edge innovation, apps, um, things like that? Uh, I thought that the public knowledge piece uh, was was very interesting and, as Michael suggested, much more nuanced than people thought of it. But I did think that they missed a little bit of history. They, they actually accurately point out that um, a lot of Internet usage was driven by AOL's decision to go um, all you can eat, but that that was driven by AT&T's decision to do the same, and that, that was true, but it was also driven by the FCC decision to retain – um, the exemption, which meant that uh, terminating access charges couldn't be applied. And so it was actually economically viable for those companies to do all you can eat. And, and I would note Europe didn't do that. And therefore, we, uh, and there's actually some really interesting um, evidence about America as being the most innovative consumers. But part of the reason we were the most innovative consumers was because we had all you can eat packages. And so that actually was a policy that worked extremely well for the country. Secondly, on the wireless, they have a wonderful chart. Uh, which which shows that when AT&T did the one rate plan, um, it, usage went up amazingly, which I think has led to America really leading in wireless uh, devices and applications and all kinds of other things, as well as, by the way, networks, uh, which is important. But what they missed in the history was the importance of the auctions of 95 in terms of, uh, 94, 95, in terms of generating more competition. But the other thing they missed, and, and by the way, almost everyone missed this except for Reed Hunt, uh, to his credit, dropping the wireless to wired terminating access charges so that wireless, so that the usage, I mean, wireless usage prior to that was like when I was in college calling my folks cross country, you line up at 501 in the hallway, in the dorm, and say, hi, we got to talk for a minute, blah, blah, blah. In the early days of wireless uh, phones, which were 1200 bucks a month. Uh, hi, I'm calling from wireless phone. I'll just do this very quick. What changed in the psychology was really important. And so there are public policy things. And I think, again, we have to, we have to distinguish between that which is le you know, legitimate public policy and that which is just let the companies do whatever they, they want. But where should government intervene? I think transparency is obviously important. I think competition is obviously important. But it's also important for the government to understand we have to create a psychology of abundance if we want to lead in innovation. Now, how you do that is highly debatable, but that's that ought to be the goal. Does um, the FCC have a lot of psychologists on staff? <laughs> uh, 
that's actually a real that's a really great idea um, <laughs> but that would require a budget increase and I don't think that's forthcoming uh, Matthew Hussey with Cerner Snow I actually want to drill down a little bit more on Tim's question about innovation with apps and content I mean might these you know we can debate the merits of the you know the data caps but might that spur greater advancements in compression and caching technologies uh, to lessen the loads that are are being delivered over the internet or over the wireless devices. And I, I bring the point of the whole Comcast BitTorrent. I don't want to re relive that. But one of the things that was a byproduct was the formation of that P4P group, which got carriers and, you know, internet applications, BitTorrent, P2P application developers in a same room trying to optimize the delivery of that content. So I just... I mean, is there a silver lining here? Uh, yes, absolutely. Whenever there is a scarcity of, of a resource, uh, you know, very clever minds get to work on, on fixing that. And when we, because one of the things we don't realize is why did, why did, why is this iPhone and Android devices, why are they so cool? Because they're essentially computers put in, your, in the palm of your hand designed by people that lived from an unlimited bandwidth uh, world or close to it from a wireline perspective. So they are extremely chatty. And uh, only recently did some of the uh, device manufacturers, um, you know, step up to the plate. I think one of the, one of the reasons, you know, you read the statistics of, oh, uh, this device is more uses more data, or this platform uses more data than the other. For example, right now, uh, Android devices are using more data than Apple devices, and it's touted as a success for uh, Android because people love it more and, and use it more. But the unsung hero story is that Apple actually put a tremendous effort in optimizing the way the iPhone communicates with the network and has made it substantially more efficient. And, and one of the wonderful things about, you know, BlackBerry gets such a bad rap uh, these days. But one of the things that really made, made was their early hall, uh, hall to fame or claim to fame was how efficient it used the network because when they grew up, the network was extremely efficient. So the data caps hopefully are and I know are leading both device manufacturers and application providers to use spectrum more efficiently. Uh, your, your point is exactly right, except that I think it ignores the larger story of innovation. Read Mark Andreessen's description of how he innovated with uh, Mosaic uh, as a, in, in Wired magazine. Uh, and he talks about having unlimited computing power. Read Outliers, where Bill Gates and Paul Allen had unlimited computing power as, as students in junior high school. The reason why all of the foundation blocks of the uh, internet actually come out of um, uh, the universities is because they had much higher speed networks. So wh while your point is right, I would, I would say it's much, and, and undoubtedly people work on that, but I'd rather be the country that invented fantastic applications that everybody in the world wants to use than the country that only invented data compression technology. Uh, another question? Hi, uh, I'm going to channel, channel a colleague, Chris Segoyan, who many of you guys know, and try to tie it back to the last panel um, around uh, what the, the gentleman from the Department of Justice had said about requesting information that, uh, from wireless companies that already collect it. And so Chris often argues that, for example, Cricket doesn't record, doesn't provides unlimited plans and doesn't record any metering data with regards to downloads and IP address connection history, and therefore law enforcement can't get it because they don't do metering and they and and law enforcement can't go. I I'd love to get your take on whether you think that's a valid approach, whereby pushing to a, a or a valid perspective, where, whereby pushing to metered plans, we're now facilitating additional tracking on the network and additional accounting, which can be accessed accessed by multiple parties, including law enforcement. I think that was the last thing on the mind of the networks <laughs> of, of the carriers. So it's, it's one of these unintended consequences. Um, I, I, have an, I have another question. Uh, it was brought up by a panelist from the, last, from the first panel today in the pre-conference. 
Um, and it kind of made me think about if, if, you know, Michael is saying that this is a, a looming problem, it's a really big problem here. Um, wouldn't you think there'd be more industries, whether it be app developers or, or, or device manufacturers or other people getting up in arms about this on the, in the impact of innovation? Uh, one question that came to mind because the first panel today was, was advertising. Um, if you're paying a me, you know, by the megabyte um, uh, by the, and, and bundled with those downloads are advertising. Uh, so you're paying not only for the content that you're receiving, but you're also paying for the advertising that goes along with it, which in, arguably enables you know this cornucopia of of, of services and apps. Um, aren't people going to start saying, "Hey, you know, I don't want to be downloading the advertising along with my content," and there'll be ad blockers and things like that, and there'll be a real tension between the advertising industry, uh, the app manufacturers, and and you know the the data plans. And and won't we see? Why aren't we seeing that yet? Well, I, th I think that, I think that's a good point, and someday uh, we might, and that will be something that pushes carriers to, to changing changing how they view caps. But I think part of the answer is what um, is what Roger said initially, which is that the things that are sucking up bandwidth it's video right now, um, and you know, and that's pretty much it. The other apps that we use, Twitter, uh, you know, those are very light bandwidth. Even you know, Pandora streaming music, it's like 64 kbps. Um, that's K, not M. Uh, so. I, I think right now it's. I mean, it's mostly video, and the, these other things um, aren't aren't having that same kind of effect. But it's certainly plausible that they could. I think. Um, I think. I think Scott's right. I think that's that is a huge part of it. And another part of it is that, as Blair has been saying, a lot of the technologies and the apps that are going to need fat pipes don't exist yet. So the the companies aren't complaining because they they aren't companies yet. And the companies that see a future where they might have problems with data, like Facebook, is probably doing some sort of calculus. Mean, I don't know, but they're probably doing a calculus and saying, okay, we're big enough that if we get to that place, maybe we can cut a deal with AT&T and Verizon or with somebody and find a way to, to deal with this for us. But it's one of, the, one of the hardest things with any of this stuff is that the impact is going to be on the technology that doesn't exist yet, on the company that doesn't exist yet. And having the confidence to protect that company, even when you don't know what it is, is a very hard thing to do in the here and now, but is also a very valuable thing. All right. Well, so the last, the last basket, I think, and the last question I would ask you is, you know, since we are on Capitol Hill here, and uh, this is the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, I uh, wanted to, uh, you know, what is the role of government? And we've touched upon that. Blair talked about transparency and antitrust. Um, we've had some discussions about metering. Um, I mentioned that um, the, the state, the city government measures my frozen yogurt consumption and, and accounts for that. The federal, this morning, we had Patty Poss, who's the head of the Mobile Technology Unit at the Federal Trade Commission, and I, I wouldn't have guessed five years ago that the federal Trade Commission would ever have a mobile technology uh, uh, bureau. So, um, I guess in leaving, I may ask everybody going from Mary all the way down: Is you know, what is the is there an appropriate role for government now and maybe in the future? Yeah, the, the, the most appropriate role for government right now is to continue to focus on spectrum availability, which uh, we're we two years from Blair's plan. Uh, we've made significant progress with the bill that passed uh, in February, but a lot of work remains to be done. Um, we are at the beginning of the mobile broadband era, and we simply have to have the spectrum available to uh, fit the LTE networks of tomorrow. Um, so we've got to continue uh, down the road of, of looking at spectrum availability, both on the mobile license side as well as on the unlicensed Wi-Fi side, to make sure we're putting spectrum in the supply chain. Otherwise, uh, the, the data plan situation just gets, gets, just gets worse over time. So I would say that's the most immediate need, in addition, I think, to the, to the topics that you mentioned, Tim. Uh, I agree with everything on spectrum, uh, and I do think that there's a paradynamic shift that we're, we're going to have to go through um, to make sure that more of the offloading and sharing is, is feasible, because that's going to really be the only way to get, get to where we need to go. Um, the, the second thing is the point that I made earlier is that the government ought to, as it thinks about uh, social policy and certain what we refer to in the plan as national purposes, uh, we ought to just look at the question, open up the question to what is the impact of this on that. And maybe there's no impact, but that, that's a, an appropriate inquiry for the government to do. 
I, I leave all spectrum things to Harold Feld, so I can't comment on the spectrum part. But um, I think the role of government right now is to, is to ask questions and to understand what's going on. I think everyone in this room can agree that communications networks are critical to all sorts of things that we care about and that any usage-based pricing, any data caps will have a huge impact on how they are used. And so there is an incredible public interest in understanding how that how those things come to be what they're doing what their what their situation is and to answer an earlier question i mean it is important to understand the motivation it's important to understand the the question being answered the problem being addressed because that's the only way you can think critically and coherently about whether or not the answer or the solution is correct but right now it's it's not a regulatory space it is a question asking space and an understanding space Larry, you've admitted that you can't read a congressional bill, but, but what's the role of government? Well, I think obviously spectrum is very important. I think the government could play a major role in assuring transparency. Uh, so your your yogurt scale would apply to your, uh, your data plan as well. Uh, I think the government can play a role in consumer education, as the Federal Trade Commission often does, to help uh, consumers understand the situation they're in and protect themselves, at least as best as they can. And I also agree that the government can play a role in carving out uh, unlimited access to essential services, whether that's medical, educational, uh, pro products like FedNet and C-SPAN and other, other kinds of uh, downloads that uh, we publicly deem as something that is in the public interest. Um, like I said, I think the Department of Justice has an important role to play. I think sometimes people say that uh, it should be left to antitrust issues because they see that as a convenient way to say to, to, act, to believe that the government shouldn't really be doing much of all much at all. I don't believe that. I, I think the Department of Justice really does play an important role, and they should be they should investigate when they think things are, are anti-competitive. Uh, the second is the, is the spectrum issue, uh, and and um, it the, the bringing spe more spectrum into the market. Uh, the FCC has to be careful, I guess, not to make sure that it doesn't take more spectrum away from the market. So look back at the light squared issue. Um, so now they've just decided that basically, uh, um, I think 15 billion megahertz pops are off the table for broadband. Nope, can't be used because the GPS industry complained. Um, we've got to be careful about that. That's, you know, the snap of a finger is that much spectrum gone. Uh, I think they've got to be careful to not make the kind of mistake. Well, what we can, what we use, uh, could use from Congress would be policies that uh, help uh, foster innovation and uh, investment in innovation rather than, than create barriers. Obviously, we need more spectrum, but I think what, what ultimately would be extremely helpful would be a rewrite of the Telecom Act. It's the Telecom Act of 1996. We're in 2012. Um, I really want to thank uh, this this panel was very gracious. Um, we, we had a lot of folks up there, a lot of different perspectives. A really good discussion back and forth. One of the most interesting topic discussions I've had on this topic I, I've seen. And I, I really want to thank the panel and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.